Uh, thanks. So I'm also from Oracle. Uh, like, I, you're not from Oracle, obviously, but <laughs> previously we're from Oracle. Um, so from the research lab. So originally it was Sun, uh, as you also mentioned. Um, and I started just when, just a little bit before Sun was acquired by Oracle um, at Sun, Sun Microsystems Laboratories. So Oracle Labs is sort of the, the, the subset of Sun Labs, uh, plus a whole bunch of extra people that have come on since. Um, so Oracle, most of you have probably heard of Oracle, hopefully. Um, if through nothing else, the annoying little Java pop-up thing that you occasionally get prompting you to update Java. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the research labs were based uh, just in the city on Adelaide Street. Uh, originally, a long, for a long time, it was next to Central Station, but we just moved the start of the year to a um, slightly nicer uh, facility there. Uh, we take on. I, I was originally a, um, studied computer systems engineering at QUT, not UQ. Um, but there's a whole bunch of uh, we we take in interns each year, uh, either undergrads or sometimes uh, PhD students or, or post um, grads as well. Uh, and we also do take a lot of students from the SEED program. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one at all. So it's like a you can um, there's a separate organization called SEED. And basically, industry um, say they have certain positions available that they want, um, they like to take students in to fill. And the CEDA also organizes with the universities uh, to find students for those positions. Um, so it, the way it works is uh, if you're doing an engineering degree, you have to get, I think it's 60 days work experience. Um, so this program is one way of doing that. Uh, so you, um, you get the 60 days work experience, and uh, I think it's a $5,000. Um, uh, money to get paid in installments uh, and you also obviously get the experience um, with the company and it also counts to uh, if you're at QT, I'm not sure if this is the case at UQ um, it counts towards one of your units that you do there so I'm not, I have to check with UQ there yes. right, cool so when it gets to that point, yeah, if you look, look for Oracle there, you might see a few positions from, from us um, and we've also got just uh, regular internship positions. So those ones are the equivalent of um, usually 60,000 a year. Um, and they, they're usually six months, but it depends on the project. You might get one for longer or shorter. Um, so they're on the Oracle website. It's, uh, I'm not sure, our website recently got updated, but uh, you have to kind of look for the little careers link down the bottom, unfortunately, and then go through and select you know, jobs in Brisbane and so on. Um, and we'll sometimes also send it out to uh, different um, contexts we have, so you might get it on your mailing list or, or not here. So our group is based mainly around program analysis, so we write uh, software to analyze other software. Uh, originally, um, the original project that I started working on was Parfait, which is a bug checking tool, so automatically detecting uh, problems in C code originally, C and C++ code, so things like buffer overflows, null pointer dereferences, those kind of issues. Um, and then more recently, we're also working with Java code, so finding uh, there's a lot of popularity around some Java security vulnerabilities um, in the past uh, couple of years. So our team has been working on um, automate, like software to automatically detect those kind of issues so developers can fix them before it gets out um, onto all of your machines, uh, exposing you to potential attacks. <laughs> um, so there's some a lot of interesting work there in that Parfait uh, project. Uh, but today I'm talking about another project, uh, also pr related to program analysis, so, um, but slightly different takes. So we're not trying to detect bugs. We're trying to assist uh, developers in understanding the code. So what we're calling, we're calling it a code comprehension tool. So it's helping you um, sort of do your own manual analysis of the code, but with a few little helping points, uh, as well as visualizing a lot of the data that you have about software. So. A code, we're calling it a code comprehension tool. So basically what we mean by that is if you really want to know what's happening uh, in a certain, if you want to know the behavior of a certain piece of software, you generally read through the source code, right? And if you've got a pretty small program, you know, a few thousand lines of code, that's not too bad. You can read through that pretty easily and, and you're all good. But what if you have 10 million lines of code? Um, and a lot of the code bases that we have internally at Oracle are of this size. So the Oracle database, uh, the Solaris operating system, 
Oracle Enterprise Linux, that are all sort of in this magnitude, tens of millions of lines of code. It's a lot of software. If you're a new developer coming into this especially, that's pretty daunting, getting your head around that. If you think about um, your IDE, on screen at any one time, you probably have about 50 lines of code. Um, so 50 lines of code is that sort of white speck in the middle there. So you've got quite a lot of code. And if you're wanting to understand what's going on in this little subset, um, it's not enough just to read that code, right? You have to sort of, it'll reference other functions and types and so on. So you have all these dependencies that are going off into other parts of this code base that you don't know. Um, and then those other parts will also reference other areas of the code base again. So you've sort of got this really massive search space to work out what's actually going on. Um, so, I mean, there's some features that you, most of you are probably familiar with in integrated development environments. So, um, Eclipse, IntelliJ, NetBeans, uh, those kind of tools, uh, Visual Studio. So, things like jumping to definition, finding usages, uh, even like class overviews, type hierarchies, and so on. But for a lot of these really large code bases that we have internally, um, and most of them are C and C, these ideas don't really handle that very well. And there's a few issues there. One is just scalability, dealing with that much code. Um, another one is imprecise language recognition. So oftentimes, the compilers that we build this software with uh, have slightly different, a slightly different understanding of the code to what the IDE does. So IDEs have their, often have their own parses of the code to work out what they understand about the code. And sometimes it doesn't agree with what the compiler thinks. There's also issues with custom build systems. So the, for the... In, for the IDE to understand what's going on in the code, it needs to understand your build a little bit so it knows what actually gets um, compiled together, linked together, and so on. So um, internally, and maybe this is surprising, I'm not sure, uh, a lot of these large C and C++ code bases, the developers are using sort of basic text editors and text search tools, so things like Vim and Emacs, which are, uh, you know, I don't know whether, does anybody here use those editors for coding? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> and then for things like code navigation, they'll use tools like uh, grep, uh, sed, and cscope. So cscope is the sort of text indexing based tool. Um, and they do that because it's fast and simple, uh, but it's also imprecise. And by that I mean, so if you say, uh, find me where this uh, reference to ID uh, is used in the code base, it's going to give you back results for every single local variable called ID, parameter called ID, field called ID, in this 10 million line code base. So you're going to get lots and lots of results, and they're not really that useful. Um, so that's the example on the right here. We've got, uh, I think that's actually the Ruby uh, implementation in C. Um, if you do that search for ID there, we're using something like Cscope, um, you'll get a, whole, a bunch of results. And the real one, obviously there's only one actual definition. Um, so you sort of waste this time trying to you know, work through this. Um, and in general, the IDs also have a relatively low level um, focus. So they're, they're optimized for editing this one, one bit of code. You're not sort of getting this overview of uh, what's going on in the, the larger picture of the code base. So with this project, Frappe, where it's a, a tool we're developing to help, help with these kind of understand, code understanding issues, but we want to make sure that we're providing precise dependency information. So um, but also with easy build integration. So you can get that precise information you get from your IDE, but it scales to these really large code bases without any precision issues. Um, and we also want to let, allow users to specify uh, high-level queries directly. So oftentimes when you're jumping through to find definitions for things, um, you usually have some high-level purpose in mind. So maybe like you've got some point in the code base where there's some value that is not what it should be, and you're sort of following back through the code to see where that came from. Um, and also just to show users in general the broader context of these really large systems. So the general idea behind the tool is that we take the source code, and from the source code we extract a precise dependency graph of the software. Um, so the nodes in this graph are things like functions, structs, macros, all the sort of code entities, and the edges of the relationships between them. So one function calls another function, one function writes to a certain field or variable. And then we let users query that graph uh, and also display the results of those queries. So we're using a dependency graph because we feel it's a fairly natural representation of code. Uh, when we're talking about code, when we're thinking about code, that's generally how we view it. We have things like core graphs, uh, type hierarchies, control flow graphs, data flow graphs, and so on that all sort of fit in with this general idea of codes as, as graphs. Um, and then the nodes and edges, as I said, are things related to a whole bunch of different levels of the code. So we have 
information from the build system, so where nodes are the, the modules, like the .o files, for example, executables, that kind of thing, um, with edges representing the linking information, which source files get compiled into what object files, which object files get linked, um, and so on. And then also things from the file system, so your source is organized into directories and, and source files. Uh, stuff from the C preprocessor, so things like macros, uh, if defs, includes, that kind of thing. And also, finally, stuff uh, from the actual symbols in the code itself. So I don't know if, if any of you have done the compiler unit, but a lot of that stuff would make a lot of sense if you've done that. So then the idea is, like, once you have this graph representation, you can specify some of these um, high-level questions as graph queries. So, and also the lower-level ones. So if you think of something like go to definition, um, if I'm in a certain function main and I see a reference to buff, um, what I'm then doing is, um, from this particular function, I'm looking for the outgoing right's edge to buff there to take me to a node that represents that particular definition of buff rather than just any buff. I'm searching for buff in all of the nodes. Or similarly for find references, if I'm on the definition of buff and I want to find everywhere it's referenced, I just look for all the incoming edges. And these are typed, so I can look, for example, only where it's being written or anywhere it's being read as opposed to all references. Um, but then you might want to ask a more general question. So maybe something like, if I change this macro, um, what's all the, the files this might eventually flow onto, affect, or break? So if I change this macro first, it's being expanded in these other macros. One of those other macros is being expanded in these other functions. Um, and so I can sort of get an impression for how much of the code um, like potentially affecting by changing this particular bit of behavior. So just to break it down a little bit more from the source code, um, we extract all this detailed dependency information um, by wrapping the normal compilation tools. So um, whether it's GCC or ICC or something like that, uh, also LZ um, archiving and so on. So with these tools, we'll still run the native you, we have a wrapper around that, so instead of running GCC, you'll run a wrapper around GCC, and that'll still run your native command, but it'll also run the Clang compiler, which is a different compiler that we've um, modified to output this extra information that we, we want to grab. And from there, we import it into a graph database, uh, not a relational database. Um, so at the moment, in this project, we're actually using Neo4j, which is not an Oracle database, um, but I, I don't know if any of you have heard of Neo4j. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a, it's, it's working for, we wanted something simple that we could just have on the file system because we're in a research lab, so we need to try and get people trying this stuff. And it's a bit too much to ask for them to set up a large uh, database just to try out our tool. Um, but there's also a reason graph shape data, it sort of makes sense uh, when you're querying if the model of your data matches the, the model of the query language. Um, so there's a, there's a nice um, ease of understanding there when you're specifying these queries. So from there, we have editor plugins for Vim and Emacs, which is the ones that most of these developers are using. Um, so they can, they can uh, do the same thing you would do in IDE, a key combination to jump to a definition or find references. Um, they have command line scripts where they can just ask sort of high level queries in a query language. Um, and then we have a web UI, which is what I'm gonna talk mostly about um, today. So the easiest way to sort of show what we're doing in the web UI is by actually giving you a demonstration. Um, so I'll get out of this. So um, what I've got here is I've run Frappe over the Linux kernel, uh, an older version, 2.6. Um, and I'm showing, we expose that uh, database through a web server. Um, so we have a REST API that the Vim and Emacs plugin used to, to grab that information, as well as the command line scripts. And we also have this web interface for uh, doing the same thing. Um, but the first thing you know about the web UI is that we're actually, um, we've got this visualization uh, front and center here, uh, sort of using a map kind of metaphor for the code. So it's a little bit um, bright to see, but uh, we've sort of got each of the continents here uh, are basically the high level directories in the Linux code base. So we've got stuff like the kernel, um, memory management, sound, file system, include directories and so on. And so every, every node in our graph basically has a corresponding area on this map. So I can zoom from my high level code and go in to see some of these subdirectories. And as I keep going, I can start to see the individual files. Uh, and as I go a little bit further, 
I start to see the, the functions and structs and macro definitions and so on inside of them. So each of these areas is a node in that graph. When I click on it, I can see what it is. Um, and we've also got that hooked up to uh, the source code as well. So for any of these particular points on the map, you can click it to see the corresponding source. And it's all um, syntax highlighted and cross-referenced. So the colors here tell you what type it is. Uh, so red is functions, uh, orange here is macros. So it's easy to tell quickly whether something's an, a function like macro or actually a function, um, which can be sometimes confusing in C. Um, and from there, if we zoom back out, um, that's sort of the basic uh, idea of the maps here. So you've got a, an area where any bit of your code is available there. So if we search for something in particular, um, we can see our search results. Uh, and we also know what type they are. So we have our macros versus our functions. And if we want, we can restrict that to say, OK, we only care about um, functions or not. But the idea with the map here is that when you have, even if the, you don't have a precise search, like you search for ID or something where there's lots of results, you can quickly use the map to filter that down. So maybe I have, um, in this case, without sort of going through the results here, in this case there's only two, um, but I know that the, the results that I care about are in kernel. So straight away I know that the one I want is this dot here, and I can click on that immediately to see the code that I'm interested in. Uh, so we also can look, um, if we do find references for this particular node, um, by default, what we're seeing is the incoming references. So here we've got two um, incoming references, both from within futext.c. Uh, we can also look at the outgoing references. So these are the, the dependencies that our function futextlockpy has. So the types that I'm using, the other functions that I'm calling, and so on. And again, like um, it's sort of giving you a high-level overview of what these dependencies are. So looking at the source, um, you know, all of this might look fine. It makes sense what it's doing, and so on. But by having this map here, maybe I'm seeing that, OK, my kernel code's using um, a bunch of stuff in include, several things within the kernel, and one thing going over to this island over here. And maybe that's something that it shouldn't be doing from an architectural point of view. Um, and that's immediately obvious when it's on top of the map, uh, where it's not so much from the source code. So, and, and you can filter these down. So if I did want to see um, what's the stuff in include, um, I can filter to that subset. Um, so obviously both of these islands have included in the name. Yeah, okay. Um, the include directory, or I can do stuff like I just want to see um, the things that it's calling, or just the things that it's writing to and so on um, fairly quickly. But then we also do um, stuff that's not related just to the direct dependencies, but also transitive dependencies. So if I open this same f function in my chains tab here, you'll see a bunch of red uh, on top of the map. So the basic idea here is it's not just the things that I'm calling, but the things those things are calling, and so on transitively. Um, so the, the general idea is from this function, this is all the code that I'm potentially exercising from this part of the, the code base. So this is an entry point into my code base, for example. We'd expect it to go to quite a bit. But transitively, my code within the kernel here is depending on stuff in the memory management code, um, some stuff in the file system, obviously stuff in the include directories, and so on. But the idea is that maybe you see something that looks out of place. So if this was the uh, database code, for example, and I'm in, um, uh, I'm looking at the memory management code, the, like the core, a core part of the database, and I see some red over in the SQL parser, it, it's a bit weird for that dependency to be going that way. Um, so the next question with any of these is like, how do you actually how is it getting there? So from my particular function, how am I getting over here to file system? So I can right click any of these red regions, uh, and some of these paths look pretty hairy, um, to see how it's actually getting there. So we see all of the, you know, FUtext logpy is calling put FUtext key, which calls drop FUtext key refs, and so on to get there. Uh, so if you have like a, you know, printout somewhere where you know something's happening, and you want to see how it got there from some entry point, um, that's one way to, to sort of find it. And we can do the same sort of things for include files, uh, as well as macro expansions and so on. So from this header file, what are all the C files this transitively gets included in, or vice versa? So from the C file, what are all the header files that it's including? Or is this C file transitively including some other header file? So you can, you can solve these questions um, a lot more immediately. 
And behind the scenes, these are all just graph matches. So I'm finding the shortest path, for example, from my C file to my header file that I'm interested in. Um, and there's a lot of other queries you could potentially do as well. So um, we want to do a lot more with what queries you can actually specify and exposing a query language directly. But in this UI, we don't currently. Um, we're also doing metric overlays on top of this visualization as well. So while this doesn't directly relate to the graph data structure that we're backing it with, um, often we have a lot of extra information about the code uh, from the version control system, so how old, how long ago this particular file was modified. Um, often there's code ownership information, so who's the primary developer for this particular area of my code. So if there's something in there that you know, I'm having trouble understanding, I might want to go see who I can talk to about that. Um, there's also things uh, related to when you dynamically run your program, so profiling information. Um, as well as test coverage and that kind of thing, where if you have this kind of uh, math metaphor, uh, it's easy to see which parts of the code are, are involved in all of those. So for something like uh, code age, if I turn it on here, the colors are unfortunately quite washed out. Um, but if I zoom in a bit, hopefully you can sort of see. It's basically, the basic idea is that the heat map kind of coloring here. So things that are um, particularly, so th this number here represents how many commits ago this file was last touched. Um, so the things that were touched a very long time ago are faded out, and the things that have been touched quite recently um, are green. Uh, and you can swap those around or change the thresholds uh, live. So if you wanted to see everything that's been changed in the last um, 1,000 commits, for example, um, you can set that threshold and then get a binary partition between the stuff older than that threshold or, or newer than that threshold. Um, so we also have a bunch of information. Uh, here we have maintainers. So this is, again, a little hard to see. Um, but basically, who's the primary maintainer for each part of Linux kernel? So each solid area of color is a particular developer. Um, and it mostly corresponds to the directory structure here. Um, so there's a particular person responsible for that area. Um, but when you look at the kernel, it's a little bit more not quite a directory to maintain that kind of match. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other metrics that might be interesting or might not be. Um, so things like from the, derived from the graph itself. So things like outgoing calls. So per function, um, again, quite difficult to see. Um, so how many outgoing calls there are. So generally, if something's higher up in the call graph, it'll call out to other things. If it's lower down, lots of things call it. So if you're looking at incoming calls, um, you could, for example, see the functions that are generally utility type functions as opposed to controller functions and so on. But what we'd really uh, like to do with this is more of the dynamic information, which I don't have here, um, but things like profiling and test coverage, so you can quickly see which parts of your code um, are largely missing tests. Um, so that was the web UI. Uh, I'll leave the demo there for the moment, but in terms of where we're going with this project, uh, there's quite a lot of work to do still. Um, so there's a lot more of the same. So with our dependency graph, making that more detailed. So at the moment, we just sort of have a fairly high level one with functions, functions calling functions, and so on. Um, but having some of the actual value flow information, for example. So there's a value passing from this parameter um, to this particular variable, and then from there to something else. So you can sort of transitively follow your value back. So one of the examples I gave coming in here was I'm at a certain point in the code, and I know there's an incorrect value there. Um, so where could that have come from? So adding these extra details of the dependency graph, so those kind of queries then become possible, uh, as well as other things too. Uh, more languages, so at the moment we support C, C++, and also Java. Uh, primarily just Java SC, we don't do sort of web application level <laughs> Java, because a lot of dependencies there that are done outside of the, the code itself. Uh, but we do uh, branch the, the gap between Java and C, so the JDK itself um, has a, a lot of bits that call into native code. Um, so we're sort of bridging that gap between the two languages there. Uh, more overlays, as I said, to do with the dynamic information about your code. Uh, but also the other issue that I've never really talked about at all is what we're seeing here is just a snapshot of, of one version of the code. We're getting dependencies. There's one version. You can ask queries about that one version. But in reality, everyone generally has a slightly different version of the code to the one that you have in this central database somewhere. So what we're currently working on is a way of sort of efficiently um, managing this graph information, dealing with an evolving code base. So over time, we're adding a few more, like a few lines get removed, a few lines get added each version, 
and we want to be able to store and query um, this data efficiently at any point in at any point in time, basically, at any recent version, because different people are working on different versions. Um, uh, other UI things like making the general cross-referencing. So the source code there you can click through to see, as you would in a normal cross-referencer. Um, so I mean any source preview here. Um, you can click on task struct to jump to it and see its definition and so on. Um, but having a more, a more general web interface that's focused purely on that, as well as the local structure within the function. So having some graphical visualization showing you the, the value flows, data flows and control flow within the function itself. Tied in with that more detailed dependency graph. And also a lot of things involving the user, so customizing, um, sorry, annotating and sharing. So we think that this map kind of visualization is a, a pretty um, good way of getting a high level overview of the code base. You have an area on there for high level components as well as low level functions and, and variables and so on. Um, so as a way of communicating uh, about how the software works, leaving annotations on certain islands or areas, paths through the code, the adding annotations to those. So a good example might be something for a, a database, for example, if you're a new developer coming into this. A good starting point is, okay, what's um, the life lifetime of a query? So if I, if I run an SQL query, what parts of the system is that hitting? Um, and what are each of those parts for? So if you can sort of highlight that path and have extra information about each of them, for someone just getting into this massive code base, that's obviously a big, a big help. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm from yeah, Oracle Labs, based here in Brisbane. Uh, similarly, uh, intern intake usually is around um, media, depending on what you're doing. Like if it is seed, I think seed has a couple of times a year they come in. You can either do, for example, summer plus first semester, um, whereas the internships will generally uh, align with the half a year. It doesn't actually matter when um, you actually start. but. Our, our budget for interns basically comes in on the um, fiscal year, so. <laughs> um, so anyway, that, there's lots of interesting projects there. If you have any interest in um, sort of program analysis or compilers, if you like that course, there's a lot of teams within the labs here that would probably love to have you. Um, so keep an eye out for uh, positions on the Oracle website. Um, and also if you like development tools in general. So I mean, our group is program, program analysis, but we're using program analysis to help uh, improve code quality. So that's with detecting bugs and so on. Um, but also helping users understand the codes that are introduced bugs uh, better. And also productivity, so ways we can make their lives easier. Um, so if you're interested in either of those areas, uh, Labs is a pretty great place uh, to, to get started. So with that, are there any questions? So for... Um, for the Linux kernel, so th there's two parts to this. So one is getting the data, uh, which we do as part of the build process. Um, so the overhead generally is about 1.5 to two times um, the normal build time. Uh, so once you have that data, uh, we then have an import. So we, we output for every object file, for example, a, a .fo file, which is a frappe output file, with the extra information in it. And the import step just slurps all those in and sticks it into the graph database. Um, that usually doesn't take too long, so it'll be proportional to the amount of data there is generally, um, but maybe like um, 0.5 times whatever the build usually takes. So that is a very rough guide um, because it depends on the code that's inside each of the files that you have. If you've got generated code, there'll be a lot more information um, coming out of that. Uh, and then the visualization itself, once it has the data available in the graph, for Linux it takes about a minute and a half um, to, to generate the, the code maps. Uh, for uh, I think Bash, which is quite a bit smaller, um, it takes about 10 seconds. So it sort of it depends on the size of the, the code base. So with the maps, obviously talking about this, how code bases actually evolve over time. Um, if you come back, you, know, you look at your map, you learn where everything is. Uh, so intuitively, you know that okay, my kernel codes down the bottom left. This is in the top right. If you come back the next day, uh, with the code slightly changed and everything's upside down, um, obviously that effort of learning where things are, so when you overlay data, you know what everything corresponds to without actually needing to see the label. Um, that goes to waste if these maps aren't stable uh, across time. So the extreme case of that is, uh, as you would have in an IDE, you're editing code live, right? Um, so as I'm writing my code, I want the map to be updating. And you want the change in the code to be proportional to the change in the map, generally. Um, so we've put a lot of effort into the algorithms behind generating the map um, to make them uh, stable. So if I have a small change, uh, there'll be a small change in the layout. 
Or if I have a big change, it's basically a free-for-all. <laughs> Anything can happen. Um, so I actually cut a bunch of slides to keep it shorter, where I explained the visualization a little bit more <laughs> behind that stuff. But um, yeah, like that's the, the obviously over time part is something we're working on a lot right now, because I think you need that to make it useful. <laughs> yeah. Probably a bit more than what you asked, so. <laughs> yep. In theory, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, like, if you, you generate this data statically, so I mean, if you have the static version of the code that you're running, uh, you can have it there. Um, and it would be ideal if we could see live even, like, where the code is up to, that kind of thing. You could definitely do that, like, with the technologies that we have, but we're not there yet. <laughs> so basically, we have an API where, you know, you can say, um, for this function name in this file on this line, um, what's the location on the map? And you can get back the location information. Or, but for this directory, what's the bounding polygon on the map? Um, so there's like an API where you can do whatever overlays you want, really. Um, so I mean, it, it's just a matter of connecting them together. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that would be cool, like seeing live execution. But I mean, you just get lots of flashes yeah, yeah. all over the place quite quickly. So you probably want to, you know, yeah, down the runtime right. speed or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.